morning, church. Welcome to this gathering of Richland Hills Christian Church. I know a lot of our folks are online this morning. There's been a lot of illness going around the congregation this last week, and so that's why we're so thin in numbers in here. But I trust many are watching online. We're glad to have you and thankful for the opportunity to, to have this technology to be able to reach one another, even when we're isolated at home. Uh, well, on the back side of your bulletin, you'll find various announcements about our life together as a church. The, the main thing I'm going to point out today is just simply that tomorrow, as you know, the 4th of July, it's Independence Day, and uh, Richland Hills is having their Red, White, and You celebration. Uh, we will have a booth set up it's from 9 a.m. to noon tomorrow morning at the link uh, over by all the main uh, city buildings there off Baker Boulevard near 26. Uh, so plan to come up and... Uh, Say hi to those of us that are, are manning the booth and try and connect with our Richland Hills neighbors uh, just to establish some relationships, to distribute some gospel literature, some Bibles, to have a fun game for the kids there uh, to play. Red, White, and You tomorrow from 9 to noon at the link. Our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 135. Psalm 135 says this. Praise the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Give praise, O servants of the Lord. For I know that the Lord is great, and that our Lord is above all gods. Whatever the Lord pleases, he does, in heavens and on earth, in the seas and all the deeps. He it is who makes the clouds rise at the end of the earth, who makes lightnings for the rain, and brings forth the wind from its storehouses. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this time together to worship. Help us to find comfort and encouragement in knowing that you do whatever you please. That you are at work in the world that you have created. The world that you have created for your glory and for the good of your people. Comfort us with this truth. Bless this time of worship as we sing your praises. For you are worthy. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Today we'll be singing My Liberty, so please be standing as you're able and join us.
come to a time of prayer, please note the names of several members of the church who have asked for prayer. We didn't add a Jean Plummer yet to the list, so you probably heard that Jean fell on Friday morning and ended up having a hip replacement surgery in the afternoon, which all indications are that it went very well. They got her up on her feet yesterday, I know. So just be praying for Jean to recover from her hip replacement surgery. And also, uh, Donald Grant also had uh, another operation this week with the defibrillator put in. So be praying for his recovery and stabilization and that he will be able to get to rehab and then home uh, very soon. We're going to have a moment of silent prayer as we bow our heads and our hearts before our Heavenly Father. And then I will lead us in a pastoral prayer. Will you pray with me? Father, we thank you that you hear our prayers. 
For we come before you not on the basis of our own righteousness, but upon the basis of the righteousness of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior, in whose name that we pray. Lord, for those whose bodies are broken, for those who are ill, for those who have just undergone surgery, we, we pray for healing. We pray for relief from pain and for full restoration. For those whose hearts are troubled, for those whose faith feels weak, we pray for peace and strength. Father, as we, we ripely celebrate the freedoms that we enjoy in this nation on our Independence Day tomorrow, freedoms that have, been, have led to amazing prosperity and to so much good throughout the world, we praise and give thanks to you for these. As we consider the privileges that we enjoy as Americans, and, and most of all, the freedom to, to openly name the name of Christ, and to seek to lead others to trust in him as well, Lord, prevent us from taking these freedoms for granted. We pray for you to uphold these liberties for generations to come. We pray for you to lead us to take full advantage of them for the sake of your kingdom on earth. So we pray for your blessing upon our nation, and for the health of your church in this nation to be faithful. We are mindful to lift our gaze off of ourselves and on to our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ who do not enjoy these same freedoms. This morning we pray for the more than 44 million people of Algeria and North Africa, where Christians make up a fraction of 1% of the population, and where there are strict laws against sharing the gospel with Muslims. We pray for a change in the culture at large there in Algeria, and in the hearts and minds of the governing authorities that would lead to a radical increase in religious liberty in Algeria. We pray that the churches there that have been recently shut down by the government would be permitted to regather openly very soon. We pray for those imprisoned for their faith there to be released. We pray for the physical and for the spiritual well-being of all who profess the name of Christ in Algeria, that they would continue to be faithful to the daunting task that you have set before them to be a light in the darkness. Lord, let the light of Christ shine brightly in Algeria and here in our own nation. Lord, hear our prayers. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Well, our scripture reading this morning comes from Isaiah chapter 55, near the end of Isaiah's ministry. Isaiah 55, beginning in verse 1. Come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk, without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me, and eat what is good, and delight yourself in rich food. Incline your ears and come to me. Hear, that your soul may live. And I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return there, but water and earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my words be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose, and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. Good morning, everyone. I just want to thank all of you, and even those who are not here, and safe travels for those who are not with us. But thank everyone uh, for Donald, my husband. Um, he's making some progress. And one of the first things he told me when he realized 
um, what had almost happened to him, not once but twice, but he wants to rededicate his life, and he hopes to come soon to return the church. He's still at the hospital, but he's in good spirits. And this is a song I've chosen from the Christian rock group, Big Daddy Weave, from his perspective, um, Redeemed. Seems like all I can see was a struggle Haunted by ghosts that lived in my past Bound up in shackles of all my failures Wondering how long is this gonna last then you look at this prisoner and you say to me, son, stop fighting a fight that's already been won. I am redeemed, you set me free. So I'll shake off these heavy chains, wipe away every stain, cause I'm not who I used to be. I'm redeemed. I'm redeemed All my life I have been called unworthy Named by the voice of my shame and regret But when I hear you whisper Child, lift up your head I remember, oh God you're not done with me yet I am redeemed you set me free so I'll shake off these heavy chains wipe away every stain cuz I'm not who I used to be cuz I don't have to be the old man inside of me cuz his day is long dead and gone because I've got a new name, a new life, I'm not the same, the hope that will carry me home. I'm redeemed, you set me free. So I'll shake off these heavy chains, wipe away every state. Now I'm not who I used to be. I am redeemed, you set me free. So I'll shake off these heavy chains, wipe away every stain, cause I'm not who I used to be. Oh God, I am not I used to be. Jesus, I'm not who I used to be. Cause I am redeemed. Thank God I'm redeemed. Thank you.
which only halfway listens so that nothing really registers. What would be the point of that? And yet, how many times did I do that as a child? Just going through the motions, not the least bit expecting for my Creator to speak to me through His Word. But He was. And He is. For each one of us gathered here today. This is what we're considering today with the famous parable of the soils. I invite you to turn with me to Mark chapter 4, verse 1. You can find it on page 38 in the second half of the Pew Bible. I'm going to begin by reading the first nine verses of our passage aloud. Mark chapter 4, verse 1, reading from the English Standard Version. Hear the word of the Lord to you. Again, Jesus began to teach beside the sea. And a very large crowd gathered about him so that he got into a boat and sat in it on the sea. The whole crowd was beside the sea on the land. And he was teaching them many things in parables. And in his teaching he said to them, Listen, behold, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on rocky ground, where it did not have much soil. And immediately it sprang up, since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns. And the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. And other seeds fell into good soil and produced grain, growing up and increasing and yielding thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. And he said, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the gift of your word to us. By the Holy Spirit, apply your word to our hearts that we may have ears to hear, eyes to see, and hearts to believe and to obey. Father, bless the preaching of your word. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Well, as in our passage last Sunday from chapter 3, once again we encounter Jesus surrounded by a very large crowd on the shore of the Sea of Galilee up near Capernaum. And once again, in an effort to be heard, he climbs aboard a boat and uses it as a floating pulpit so that all may hear his word. And he proceeds to tell them a parable. Notice how the teaching begins in verse 3. Listen. That's the message of the parable and of this sermon summed up in a one-word command. Hear. Listen. Understand. Akuate. Hear. Listen. Understand. The parable involves a sower, that is, a, a scatterer, a, a spreader of seed, and then four different kinds of soil upon which the seed falls. What's unique about this parable is, one, that, that Jesus follows it up with an explanation of what the various parts of the parable are intended to convey. That's very rare in the four Gospels, to give an explanation of the parable. And then, two, the parable and the explanation are separated by a discussion of why he teaches in parables. Verse 10. And when he was alone, so sometime later, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parables. And he said to them, To you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God. But for those outside, everything is in parables. So that, quote, they may indeed see, but not perceive. And may indeed hear, but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. Jesus is echoing Isaiah chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. In that passage back in Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah was being told by God that of the people he was being sent to warn about God's impending judgment, the vast majority of them would not receive his warning, but would instead be hardened by his, war his warning, his word of God. So Jesus, by making this connection between Isaiah's ministry and his ministry, Jesus is saying that the same hardening is taking place in the hearts of those who reject him. Most notably, the teachers of the law who had just come down from Jerusalem and had committed blasphemy by blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, claiming that Jesus, the Son of God, was actually a servant of Satan. That's what we just read at the end of chapter 3. Their destiny was sealed. And 
so the parables had a hardening effect upon them. As we read in, in verse 34 of chapter 4, skipping ahead, he did not speak to them without a parable, but privately to his own disciples he explained everything. And yet, despite only speaking to outsiders in parables, the number of disciples did continue to grow. Some of those outsiders did join the fold. In Acts chapter 1, more than 40 days after Christ was crucified, there are 120 disciples in Jerusalem. They'd either made the journey with him from Galilee or they had joined him along the way. So, so it wasn't as though the number of disciples was kept fixed from this point on in Mark chapter 4 as he taught in parables. As Jesus went around teaching publicly only in parables, some of those who heard did respond positively. They were drawn in and they sought to know more, while others responded negatively and were hardened against him. To those who sought to know more, he, he explained everything, he says, even the secrets of the kingdom of God. The secrets of the kingdom of God, namely that he is the king of that kingdom. And that in him, in this Jewish carpenter from Nazareth, the kingdom of God had drawn near. Now after his resurrection and ascension, it's not as though the apostles and the first disciples continued going around only teaching in parables publicly. And reserving the, the deeper truths and explanations for private conversations. No, they, they taught the gospel message plainly and publicly. And yet, the same fourfold responses seen in the parable of the soils, were seen in their day. And these fourfold responses are still seen today in ours. So then Jesus is using these, these four responses to the somewhat veiled teaching of his parables as a picture of the responses that would come even after everything was made plain at the cross and at his resurrection. Like the parables, the message of the gospel, the message of Christ crucified in our place for our sins, it sounds like a fable, like just a fanciful story, easily dismissed. But to those who are being saved, it sounds like the truest truth they have ever heard, the truth that makes sense of all other truths. And so those who are being saved listen to the gospel. As these disciples listen to the parable, those who are being saved listen to the gospel. They find themselves wanting to know more, to, to have even more explained to them, to feast on all the secret things that have been revealed in Christ through his word. As the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, For the word of the cross, which is the gospel of Christ crucified and resurrected, the word of the cross is folly, it's foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, he says this, For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one, a fragrance from death to death. To the other, a fragrance from life to life. The word of God is a dual-edged sword. It separates the wheat from the chaff, the goats, from the, sheep, from the sheep. Just as those who heard the warnings in Isaiah's day, those who heard the parables in Jesus' day, those who hear the gospel today cannot be left unchanged. They will either be drawn in and desire to know more of Christ, or they will be repelled and thus further hardened in their sin. It is one or the other. How is God's word falling upon your ear? Verse 13, and he said to them, that is to those who have gathered around him in private, his disciples, he said to them, do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? And he explained, the sower sows the word. That is the message that Jesus is Lord, that he is the king and only savior of the world. Notice that the sower who at first was Jesus himself and afterward was and is those who follow him, the sower, sows, the sower sows indiscriminately, scattering seed not just on good soil but on, on bad soil, on paths, on rocky ground and among thorns. As proclaimers of the gospel of Christ, we cannot know in advance how any given soul will receive the word, how any given soil 
will receive the seed. That's the picture painted here. And so we share with everyone we can. We sow indiscriminately, not able to know how someone will respond. He's going to describe the, the four different types of soils now. Verse 15. And, and these are the ones along the path where the word is sown. Remember that in the parable, in the first part, the birds came and devoured the seed that fell upon the path. When they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. The picture of path is very hard soil, trodden over time and time again. The seed that you cast onto a path just bounces off of it or is swept off like water off a duck's back. Sadly, given the very real presence of spiritual forces of evil that work to prevent people from receiving Jesus, this is the most common response to the sharing of the gospel in most cultures at most times. But recall who it is that blasphemed against the Holy Spirit in the preceding section. Who it is that is seeking to have Jesus killed. It's not Satanists, it's not atheists, it's not even the pagan Romans. It's the Jewish teachers of the law. It's the religious establishment. They are the hard-hearted pictured by the path. So there's two different types of, of hard soil. Yes, there are people who, are, who have been so given themselves over to lawless, sinful living that they either mock any notion of coming judgment when you speak of it, or they respond with anger and hostility. But then there are the self-righteous religious people who just as quickly dismiss the message of a crucified Savior, fully convinced that they are already right with God on the basis of their own merit, derived from their own adherence to rules and regulations and rituals. So that's the first kind of soil, the hard soil of religion and rebellion. Next, verse 16. And these are the ones sown on rocky ground. The ones who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy. They have no root in themselves, but endure for a while. And then when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. That's the sun that scorches the rootless plant so that it withers away. The sun that scorches is the difficulties that come from following Jesus. The difficulties that come from following Christ expose a lack of seriousness, of sincerity, of commitment. For those living in America for most of our lifetime, the, the difficulties of following Jesus have been quite minimal. But not so throughout most of history of the church in most of the world. Not so in the days of the apostles in the, in the first couple hundred years of the church as they were persecuted both by the religious leaders, the Jews, and, and by the Gentiles. With their freedom and even their lives regularly at risk, there was much at stake for following Jesus. Not so in Afghanistan today, the most dangerous nation in which to be a Christian. Not so in Algeria, as I prayed for earlier in the service. And while we in America are grateful for the lack of persecution that we have experienced, it has long been recognized especially by our brothers and sisters in other parts of the world, that this lack of persecution here has allowed these, these rootless shoots, these disingenuous believers depicted by the rocky ground, to persist in our churches for decades without ever being exposed. So, so while we bemoan the significant changes in our culture in the last 10 years in particular, that are making it increasingly more costly, to identify as a follower of Christ, to openly seek to lead others to repent of their sin and to believe in Jesus. These changes, well, they're having, and they will continue to have, a sifting effect upon our churches. And that is a good thing. It's good, most of all, for the sake of the rootless shoots to no longer be self-deceived into thinking that, that they possess genuine saving faith when they don't. But to be exposed as fraud that perhaps one day they will more readily receive the word. Seed that falls on rocky ground is those that cave under the pressures of persecution. The next type of soil is really no different. It's just that instead of being 
tribulation and persecution that leads a person to fall away. It's the challenges and temptations of the world in general. Verse 18. And others are the ones who sown among thorns. They are those who, who hear the word, but the cares of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, the desires for other things enter in and, and choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. Think about your, your experience with the church. How many have you seen in your time with, with this church alone who, upon their first visit, are, are so jazzed about being here, brimming with excitement and with talk about how they intend to get plugged in and the unique contributions that they're going to be able to make to this fellowship? But then, in a few weeks or a few months, you never heard from again. What happened? The love of sin proved stronger than the love of Christ. It should be noted that there are ways to present the gospel that actually encourage these kind of shallow, rootless responses. From the distortions of the prosperity gospel, promising health and wealth if you follow Jesus, to the, the more subtle distortions of the God has a wonderful plan for your life gospel that presents Jesus as, as the remedy for every problem that you face, whether as a genie in the bottle or as a cosmic therapist in the sky. These distortions encourage shallow, rootless responses to following Jesus. There are actually even ways to present the actual gospel that call for repentance and faith that likewise encourage these kinds of shallow, rootless responses. It happens in services like these. The preacher gives an, an emotional appeal. The tone is set with, with highly emotional music over which the preacher continues to talk or to pray making prophetic declarations about there being someone here who needs to respond. And as the congregation sings in our, their invitational song, the preacher threatens one more verse until someone comes forward. And oftentimes, people are even staged in the congregation who pretend to come forward in order to prime the pump for others to follow. Younger generations seem to be more attuned and, and repulsed by such emotional manipulation. But there was a time when it was highly effective, highly effective at creating false converts who found themselves in a far worse spiritual state than before they walked the aisle and became convinced that, that by so doing they were made right with God, rather than through wholehearted repentance from sin and devotion to Christ, the kind of faith that bears fruit. We must be careful how we present the gospel, that it be untainted. Untainted by distortion and untainted by emotional manipulation. Notice where the power is in the parable. It's not in the method that the sower uses to distribute the seed or to get it implanted in the soil. No, the power is in the seed itself. Verse 20. But those that were sown on the good soil are those who hear the word and accept it and bear fruit thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. Again, as seen in the first word of the parable, this is a call to listen. As he's about to say in verse 24, pay attention to what you hear. In the parallel passage in Luke chapter 8, Jesus says this, take care how you hear. Exposing yourself to the public teaching of the Bible weekly without listening or listening without learning. It's not merely a waste of your time. It's dangerous. It's damaging to your soul. Every encounter that you have with God's word changes you, one way or the other. So take care how you hear. And understand that genuine faith is marked by the bearing of fruit. The fruit of obeying Christ's command to repent and be baptized. The fruit of obeying his command to walk in the light as he is in the light, following his way. The fruit of obeying his command to shine the light of the gospel so that others may see. Listen now to the next section, verses 21 through 25. Verse 21. And he said to them, A lamp is brought in. That is, a lamp is brought into a dark room that's in need of light. Is it, or so he's his question, is a lamp brought in to be put under a basket or under a bed and not on a stand? Of course not. Light is for shining. 
Verse 22, for nothing is hidden except to be made manifest, nor is anything secret except to come to light. Jesus' teaching is meant to reveal who he is, to reveal the secret of the kingdom of God, not to hide it. Yes, the fullness of who he was remained somewhat veiled for a time, but, but then his crucifixion and his resurrection lifted the veil. And now the message of the cross not only reveals the secrets of the kingdom of God, it reveals the condition of the hearer's heart based on how we respond. Verse 23, if anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. It's a call for all people everywhere to listen to this man. Do you have ears? Then use them. Verse 24, and he said to them, Pay attention to what you hear. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you, and still more will be added to you. For to the one who has, more will be given. And from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. This language of, of, of the measure you use is in regard to purchasing and selling a measurable commodity of some sort, like a, like a pint of grain. A good measure is, is, is one that's not too short, or, or even one that's exact. A good measure is one that's even more than required. In that exchange, both sides of it can give a good measure to give more than is required. The same language is used in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7 and also in the parallel in Luke 6 with regards to not hypocritically judging others by trying to take the speck out of your own eye or take the speck out of your brother's eye while you still have a log in your own eye. This language of the measure you use will be measured to you. But here, in Mark chapter 4, verse 24, the language of the measure you use, it's not so much about the judgment that we make about others, but the judgment that we make about Christ and his word. It's a call to, to receive all of Christ, to accept all of his word, the full measure. It's a promise that greater understanding is available to to all who will seek it. For those who hear the gospel and want to hear more, like those who heard the parables and wanted to hear more, more understanding will be given. He's saying, hey Pharisees, never mind what you think you know about God, Father, Son, and Spirit. Never mind what you think you know about the life of faithful obedience. What has God said? That's what matters. Have you really heard what God has said? So it's a call to receive all of Christ through all of his word. It's a call also not to hold back from giving to him the full measure of yourself in exchange. Receive all of him and give all of yourself. Understanding is available to those who seek it, so we must seek it. And light is for shining, so we must shine it. For even what we think we have will be taken away from us. We must bear fruit. The passage is then closed out with two more short parables. This last section, verse 26. He said to them, The kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. He sleeps and rises night and day, and the seed sprouts and grows. He knows not how. The earth produces by itself, first the blade, and then the ear, and then the full grain in the ear. But when the grain is ripe, at once he puts in the sickle, because the harvest has come. In reading the parable of the soils in the first part of the chapter, we find ourselves saying, all we can do is sow. All we can do is to share the gospel. We can't make anyone believe. But then this parable puts a more positive spin on it. Instead of saying, all we can do is sow, we say, all we need to do is sow. The seed will do its work to create and to mature disciples of Christ. The growth cannot be explained, and it cannot be thwarted, for the power is in the seed. It's a caution to us that we need not fixate on the accumulation of or the loss of political power or, or broad cultural influence in our nation. We need not tamper with the seed to make it more palatable to those who are spitting it out. And we need not allow other good things like benevolence to take priority over the sowing of the seed. The power is in the seed. 
God will build his kingdom in his time and in his way. We must trust him and scatter his seed, shine his light. Verse 30. And he said, With what can we compare the kingdom of God, or what parable shall we use for it? It's like a grain of mustard seed, which when sown on the ground is the smallest of all the seeds of, on earth. At least in Palestinian farms at that time. It's the smallest of the seeds that they, they planted. Yet, when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and puts out large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. Saying that despite the opposition of the world, the opposition of the flesh, the opposition of the devil, despite seemingly few people hearing and listening and understanding and, and maturing, the sowing of the seed bears fruit. The proclamation of the unadulterated gospel leads to the advancement of the kingdom of God on earth in the hearts of men and women. Now, no, the, the, the image here is not of, of a great sequoia or a great redwood or a great cedar dwarfing all the other plants and trees on earth. Like General Sherman, the mustard plant at most grows to be 12 feet tall. It's not the image of Christianity dwarfing all other worldviews or, or the church dwarfing all the nations of the world. Instead, this parable is about the remarkably small beginnings of the church there in Jerusalem, producing amazingly large results. Who could have imagined that this relatively small band of nobodies would change the world? But they did. I like the imagery here in this parable of the birds that would have tried to eat the tiny little mustard seeds. That's what the birds would have done, especially with tiny mustard seeds they could easily swallow up. Imagery is that these birds that would have tried to, to, to eat up and gobble up the mustard seed eventually find refuge in the branches of the relatively enormous plant that later grew from that seed. Like Saul of Tarsus, the most well-known persecutor of the church, who went from trying to gobble it up to becoming its most prolific missionary who's ever known, taking refuge in the plant that the mustard seed gave birth to, the church. Think of how encouraging these parables must have been to the early church as they faced horrific persecution. How encouraging this passage must be in parts of the world today where, where the church seems to be utterly insignificant in size or in influence. From Afghanistan to Algeria to America. Take heart. God is at work to build his kingdom. Trust his methods. Finally, the last two verses, verse 33. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them, as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them without a parable, but privately to his own disciples, he explained everything. Can you hear? Are you listening? Are you understanding? Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the gift of your word to us. Plant your word deep in our hearts. Cause it to bear the fruit of faith and the fruit of faithful obedience. That we may diligently, indiscriminately cast the seed of the gospel all around us. And cause the seed, Lord, to take root in others, yielding a hundredfold. Bless the preaching of your word. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. During this time of response, as we sing, this is a time for each one of us to consider how God is calling us to respond to the word, to the seed that has been cast. Maybe for the first time, you need to, to respond to the call to follow Christ. If so, please come speak with me about what it means to become a Christian. Or maybe you desire to partner with this body of Christ on earth as we glorify God together by making disciples of Christ. If so, then please come speak with me about joining this church. Whether now or at the close of the service, I'll be at the front. Come and find me. And now let us stand together to sing. This week, number five on our list. It's a rather young hymn in terms of hymns, written in 1969 by Kurt Kayser. Pass It On works very well with our sermon today. Let us be singing.
against it. You want to sing, it's fresh like spring. You want to pass it on. I wish for you, my friend, this happiness that I found. Look on, you can depend. It matters not where you're bound. I'll shout. seated. Yes, as we know, tomorrow is July 4th. Great, our nation is free. Well, that means you're free to come here and come worship in this wonderful building with these wonderful people. We put on a we put on a, a great worship of our Lord, but all those things require not just your time and your talents, but your giving as well. We have done so much in this community, and there's more that we can do, from helping Binion next door to to need. All these things are are things that reach out into our community, and. I've been to a lot of churches, and this one's very good at making sure all of our funds, all of our efforts go to everything that we can do to better God's kingdom right here. Because that's what we have to do. We have to do where we're, where we're at. we got to better God's kingdom in that place. And this place is a wonderful place to do it. So be bringing your tithes and your gifts this morning. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to live in a land that is free and allow us to worship you. But let us not forget that that freedom comes with a price and that it allows for us to give to your church and spread your kingdom here. So let us do that. Amen. we come to this table, uh, we recognize that this is the Lord's table. And even for, for people, as we think about that, that rocky ground uh, that withers under the threat of tribulation and persecution for the sake of the word, 
We think about the, the thorny ground that allows the, the, the word to be choked out by uh, the, the riches, the desire for riches, the, uh, the concerns of the world, the cares of life, and the desires for other things. We are people who have recognized these temptations and at time have given in, and yet, even so, we are invited to dine at the table of the Lord. It's because of what these elements represent. The bread that we break, it symbolizes the, the body of Christ broken for his people. The cup that we drink, it symbolizes the blood of Christ shed for his people. If you are trusting in his sacrifice on your account for the forgiveness of your sins, if you have demonstrated that faith by obedience to his command to be baptized, this table is for you. Regardless of whatever Christian denomination you may identify with. We're going to have a moment where we can further reflect upon these things as we sing together. He took bread, and he given thanks, he broke it. He said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The same way also, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat of this bread and you drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. We're taking these elements together after first uniting our hearts in prayer. Let's pray. Almighty and merciful God, we praise your holy name for the gift of your salvation through your son, Jesus, who took all the sins of the world on himself on the cross, not out of anger or, or hatred, but out of love and concern. We praise you, God, for the gift that you've given us. And as we gather close to this communion table, may we all remember the sacrifice that you've made for us. Amen. As we continue in our prayer, Heavenly Father, I say good morning to you, and thank you that we have this table to come to to remind us every week of what Jesus did for us, how you sacrificed your son, and he shed his blood, which please bless this cup as a symbol of what he did for us. Thank you, dear Lord, for the blessings we have. Thank you for the people that we have that support us. Please be with those who need your help at this time. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
body of Christ shed for you. Take and drink. Let's now unite our voices together as we recite our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. It is. I know it. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that Dissolve like snow, the sun. 